Um, uh, we already have the speaker ready to go. He's uh, pumped up, full of energy. He's been here for for too long. <laughs> um, Joao also attended a, a, an alliance meeting before, uh, so uh, he's been here for a long time. Anyway, let's welcome Joao Passos to uh, to the stage and. Uh, Thank you so much for coming and looking forward to your talk. Yeah, oh, perfect. So thanks for sticking around for so long. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to be here. I, I'm in awe of the work that Morton and the resilience that Morton and uh, Alex and uh, Daniela have, have done uh, throughout this, this meeting. It's absolutely remarkable. Um, and today, if you bear with me, I'll be telling you a little bit more about my favorite subject, which is cellular senescence. You've heard a lot about this already, but I'm hoping that in my talk, I'll be able to tell you something a little bit new about senescence or unexpected. So the first thing that I'm going to do is just tell you some brief considerations on the current challenges that we face in the senescence field. And as you've heard a lot about this already, but um, you know, what happens in senescence is that basically everything in cell biology changes, okay? So there are many changes happening in the surfaceome, in the secretome, in the nucleus, in the mitochondria, in the lysosomes. But the reality is that there is no specific marker. So if we look at inflammatory factors like the SASP, inflammatory factors can be produced irrespectively of senescence. Cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitors like P21, P16, DNA damage foci, they can, be, they can happen transiently or as part of the cell cycle. They do not necessarily mean that this cell is senescent. Mitochondrial dysfunction can occur in cells that are not senescent. And beta-galactosidase activity can be present in non-senescent cells, such as activated macrophages, confluent, and immortalized cells as well. So the field, because of this issue, and this is something that the field acknowledged, has said that, okay, so the way we have to go about it is we need to look at multiple markers simultaneously. So not looking at one marker, but looking at several simultaneously. But now the technology has finally caught up with senescence. So we are um, you know, able to do single cell transcriptomics and look in detail in what happens with aging. And for instance, this is some examples that I wanted to show you. So this is work that has been done in collaboration with Diana York, sitting in the audience from Mayo Clinic, where she looked by single cell RNA-seq at the hippocampus of the aging uh, mouse. And if you look at two of the most well-established markers of senescence, like P21 and P16 expression, what you find is that these cells are not expressing at the same time. So there's actually, you know, a lot of abundance of P21 in majority of cells. They increase with age. P16 is less abundant, but the kinetics and dynamics of these two markers are not actually matching with each other. Similarly, and this is a, a recent study that we collaborated with Nathan Lebrasser's group at Mayo, where we characterized the aging muscle in a mouse. And what we see is that, again, P21 is very much abundant in many of the cell types, but actually we only see an increase in P21 in the myofibers, uh, but we don't see it in, in other cell types with age. While P16 seems to increase with age exclusively in the fibroatypogenic progenitor cells, as you heard before from Fura. Things become even more complicated if you look at the SASP. So this is unpublished data where we looked at single-cell RNA-seq and then we started analyzing the brain. 
And if we look at P21 and P16, what we find again is that P21 is very abundant. The transcript is very abundant in most cells, but actually cells that are positive for P21 and P16 are actually relatively rare. And then if you compare these cell types and look at a panel of the SASP, you realize that the SASP is actually pretty different between P16 and P21 positive cells. So actually we're not talking about that we have senescence or heterogeneity of senescence. We're probably talking about subtypes of senescent cells that are present during aging. If you look in the skeletal muscle, you have a similar picture but actually different players. Uh, again, you see very high levels of P21 transcripts. You see very low P16 levels, but then if you compare the SASP components, you realize that the P21 positive cells have their own SASP. Some of it overlaps with P16, but they are actually quite different from one another. So you may say, okay, this is something that is only happening at the level of the RNA, but we started in my lab to do studies where we can look at protein. So for instance, this is part of the Senate effort where we started looking in, in doing multi-omics and looking at a variety of different senescent markers at the protein level. In the, in, in, in this case, we're talking about an 80 year old skin. And using this method called 4i, we can actually look at a variety of different markers of senescence simultaneously in the same tissue. And what we find is that there is a huge heterogeneity in the expression of these markers. We can look at the cell type populations, but then we find that, for instance, P21 is located in carotenocytes, P16 is located in fibroblasts and melanocytes, but actually the cells that express these two markers together are quite rare, again. But then if we look at other markers that are commonly used for looking at senescence, like lamin B1 loss, HMGB1, and others, you realize that actually there's a very diverse uh, pattern of senescence. And it's likely that actually we need more multiomic approaches in order to understand it. So this is just to kind of summarize what I just said. I think that, you know, in order for us to be able to identify senescent cells, we need to use multi-marker approaches, which take into consideration the cell type. We also need to develop spatially resolved methods that have single cell resolution. And the reason I mentioned single cell resolution is because senescent cells are quite rare. So particularly if we look in aging, we need to be able to detect them. <laughs> And we need to also consider the spatial relationship between, because senescent cells are able to affect their surrounding environment. And my prediction is that actually, most likely when these new technologies become affordable, that most likely we will laugh at the way that we characterize senescence before, and that we will start using single cell transcriptomics, proteomics, and epigenomics as the optimal way to detect senescence in tissues. So if you, want to hear, if you want to read more about this subject, this is a, a, a paper that we, we, we published in Nature Aging, part of the CENNET consortium, that kind of highlights some of these challenges in terms of mapping senescent cells and also some of the, the, the future in terms of technology that we will use. Okay, so I'm moving on. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about um, mitochondria. And... This is another challenge in the senescence field is basically, so the field has elected two strategies for us to uh, deal with, with senescence in a sort of in using drugs. And one is to target apoptosis resistance. And these, and if you target apoptosis resistance, this strategy is, is commonly known as senolytic, or you can target the SASP and this uh, strategy is usually called cinemorphic. Um, and what I'm trying to convince you is that actually mitochondria are central in both these, uh, uh, both apoptosis resistance and the development of the SASP. So first of all, uh, senescent cells experience many changes in mitochondria. So um, 
mitochondria, so when senescent cells become senescent, they, they, they have changes in the electron transport chain, they have decreased mitochondrial membrane potential, they have low NAD plus NADH levels, low ADP, ATP, ADP levels, they have changes in mitochondrial fusion and fission, they have differences in mitophagy, which is the, the mechanism that allows the removal of damaged mitochondria. But for a long time, we never could understand whether these changes are merely a consequence of the senescence program or if they are somehow involved in, 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 in senescence, in the phenotype. So a lot, some years back, we decided to do a bit of a crazy experiment. So this is a proof of concept experiment. So we developed a tool where basically what we do is we take cells and we express a protein called parkin. So parkin is a ubiquitin ligase, and when mitochondria are dysfunctional, parkin goes, tags these mitochondria for degradation via mitophagy. And if you do this experiment and you treat the cells with a drug like CCCP, under certain conditions, we can basically end up with cells that have virtually no mitochondria. And we can check that because we can do 3D electron microscopy and show that these cells have no mitochondrial organelles and they also do not express any mitochondrial proteins and they also have no mitochondrial respiration. But strangely enough, these cells are alive because they are able to derive their ATP mostly from glycolysis. So we decided to do the experiment of taking senescent cells and removing their mitochondria and see what happens in terms of gene expression. And what we found, and we published a few years back, is that if we look at the components of the SASP, we realize that the SASP goes up. When we remove mitochondria, the SASP goes down. So the SASP is actually dependent on the presence or absence of mitochondria. So this work led my lab to start asking questions. So what are the mechanisms? Obviously, we don't want to remove mitochondria from cells as a therapy. This is a proof of concept experiment. But we want to elucidate the molecular mechanisms by which mitochondria drive the SASP. And we also started a drug discovery program with the idea of targeting different aspects of mitochondrial biology as a way to suppress the SASP in senescent cells. So today I'll be telling you about one of these stories, uh, one of these mechanisms that we think contributes to SASP in senescent cells. So we made this observation that if you look at mitochondria and you do super resolution microscopy and look at an outer mitochondrial protein like TOM20 and an antibody that is able to detect DNA, in proliferating cells, we can see that this DNA is mostly enclosed within the mitochondria, but we found that in senescent cells, we found evidence for DNA that is outside in the cytosol. So you can see this 3D rendering where the, the DNA is located within the mitochondria, but in senescent cells, we can see it either present in the cytosol or sort of exclu being excluded. So how do we know that this is mitochondrial DNA? We know because we found that this DNA is actually co-localizing with TFAM, and TFAM is a protein that is involved in the packaging of the mitochondrial DNA. But we also did cytosolic fractionations of senescent cells induced by different stimuli, and we can find by qPCR that there is an enrichment of mitochondrial DNA in the cytosol of senescent cells, irrespectively of the stimuli that we use to induce senescence. So what is this mitochondrial DNA doing? Obviously, mitochondrial DNA is present in thousands of copies per cell, and it has been described that because mitochondrial DNA is obviously of prokaryote origin, that it can be recognized as foreign when it's present outside of the mitochondria and can trigger an inflammatory response. So we did the following experiment where we, we took senescent cells we removed the mitochondria, as I told you before, and then we isolated mitochondrial DNA and put the mitochondrial DNA back in conditions where there are no new mitochondria that are being generated. And then we, did gen we looked at RNA-seq data, and what we found, so if we look at genes that are involved in NF-kappa-B 
sort of inflammatory genes, we found that they sort of go up in senescence, go down when we clear the mitochondria, and go back up again when we reintroduce the mitochondrial DNA. If we look at genes that are associated with the mitochondrial DNA stress response, this is interferon response, that we know it's regulated by SIGA sting, we found that these go up in senescence, down when we clear the mitochondria, go back, back up again when we reintroduce mitochondrial DNA. Then we did another experiment where we basically used the DNAs that we can induce, and this can degrade mitochondrial DNA. And if we do that in senescent cells, we find a suppression of the SASP, consistent with the idea that mitochondrial DNA is actually important for the induction of the SASP. But then came the question, why is the mitochondrial DNA leaking in senescent cells? And there's, there were two, two data, two papers that were published in, in a couple of years back that were describing that during apoptosis, that what happens in apoptosis is something called mitochondrial outer membrane permeability. So what happens here is that you have formation of some macro pores in the mitochondria by these proteins backs and back, and they allow the release of cytochrome C, and then cytochrome C can then activate the apoptosome and caspases, and then you get apoptosis. But what has been described is that this process also leads to the release of mitochondrial DNA into the cytosol, and that can activate an inflammatory pathway by a C-gas sting. So we said, okay, could it be that this process is involved in senescence? We thought it was unlikely because senescence is usually viewed as something separate from apoptosis, almost the opposite. So senescent cells are resistant to apoptosis, so it's a different cell fate. But what happened when we started to look at apoptosis in senescent cells, so we started by doing uh, super-resolution microscopy where we looked at TOM20 and cytochrome C, and we could find that in proliferating cells, both colocalize very well, but then if we looked in senescent cells, they also co-localized pretty well, but there were some mitochondria that seemed to be isolated and were positive for TOM20, but negative for cytochrome C. And then if we fractionate the cytosol of senescent cells, we find evidence for increased cytochrome C in senescent cells. We also find evidence for, for increased uh, cleave caspase 3. We also looked at the uh, uh, activated form of BACs and found that there's a subset of mitochondria, very few in senescent cells, that show this BACs activation. And we also looked at oligomerization of BACs and found that only in senescent cells you find these BACs oligomers, consistent with the idea that there is these micropores that could be driving the leakage of mitochondrial DNA. So, so if this is true, what happens if you stop these macropores from, from forming? So the way we've done this experiment is we did CRISPR-Cas9 to delete both backs and back, and then we induced senescence. And what we found is that by deleting backs and back, we could suppress the leakage of the mitochondrial DNA, but we also could suppress the SASP both at the mRNA and the protein level, but these cells still remain arrested, so proliferation is not affected. It's, it's a pathway that is driving specifically the SASP. Then we did mouse experiments where we aged mice and then we conditionally deleted both backs and back in aged mice, and then we could find that the SAS factors were decreased when we delete both backs and back in aged mice. This is an example in the liver, but we also saw it in the bone. And then we thought, can we drug this? So um, we, we actually, we knew from our collaborator, Evris Gavatiotis, who works at the Albert Einstein, who has done a very careful characterization of a molecule called BI1, which is basically a Bax inhibitor that stops this oligomerization of Bax and also the, the migration of Bax to the mitochondria. And what we found is that if we treat senescent cells with this drug, we can reduce the leakage of mitochondrial DNA. We can actually very suppress the SASP in senescent cells, reduce this minority MOMP, um, 
And then it, what we said, okay, let's treat mice with this drug. So we, we took aged mice, we injected them with this drug, and what we found is that actually all the health span parameters that we looked at were improved. So they did better in rotorod, pole test, grip strength. If we look at a variety of frailty measures, we saw that they, they, they had less frailty. If we look at bone microarchitecture, we saw that there was an improvement in both the spine and uh, femur, and if we look at SASP components, we also saw that they were decreased under these conditions. We also looked in the brain and found that there was a reduction in inflammation in the brain. Actually found that BI1 actually penetrates the blood-brain barrier. And then if we do single cell RNA-seq, we found to look at which populations in the brain show this decrease in the SASP, we found that both oligodendrocytes and microglia show an increase in the San Mayo panel, which composes several SASP components. But we also saw a decrease in P16 positivity in the brain. Okay, so this is my penultimate slide, just showing you that I think our data show that contrary to the sort of idea that apoptosis and senescence are actually some so, sort of two very separate cell fates, we find that they are actually regulated by similar mitochondrial dependent mechanisms. And that very few mitochondria that are present in senescent cells, they can drive the SAS via this process. And we think that inhibition of this process, so exactly the opposite of what senolytics are doing. So instead of killing senescent cells, we're actually stopping apoptosis, but this seems to have also beneficial effects. So we think that this may be a novel therapeutic target to counteract aging and age-related disease. Most important slide is obviously the lab that has done this work and all my collaborators, in particular, Stephen Tate, who is the, the expert in apoptosis, who got us really you know, excited about these ideas, and uh, also all the funding from different sources. And again, thank you. This is an amazing conference. Loved it. Thank you so much, uh, Joao. We have time for one quick question. Quick, quick. Really great talk. Um, thank just you. Just a quick question. Um, so this would be like a xenomorphic, if you would characterize it like that? Yes. So you would have to give it continuously, I suppose. Yes. Um, and did you check the number of senescent cells? Yes, we I mean, did. The, uh, you said in the brain the P16 goes down, but you just check what in the we, tissues? We, we, we have checked in multiple tissues, and interestingly, we actually did not find differences in P16 and P21 in most tissues that we looked at. The brain is actually an exception. So the effects seem to be very much to do with the SASP, while no changes in the cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitors. In my view, this is a good thing. We want to suppress the SAS, but we want to keep those damaged cells arrested. So I think that if we, we start looking at some of these xenomorphic interventions, this, this I think is important to keep the cell cycle arrested. All right, thank you so much, Joao. That was yeah. really amazing. Thanks. <laughs>